Welcome to today's artifact. I'm Professor Bob, and this is show number 10. This is still on the equipment that you're going to find in a fallout shelter during the Cold War. Now, last week, I did the one that was provided by the U.S. government, and you saw a pretty significant difference between some of the equipment. You either got a plastic Geiger counter or you got a metal one, and in most cases, you would have gotten the plastic one. Well, now we're on what is going on at home. Now, a lot of people would simply have put food away and just tried to stay in their basement. But as you'll find today, you can indeed buy a radiological kit for your home. It did cost $50. And that's pretty much a week, maybe two weeks worth of pay. But it looks very similar to some of the things that you found in the fallout shelter from last week. And then the government provided you with all sorts of different things. And I'm going to take you through this particular journal, which is a set of family shelter ideas, and what it costs to build different variations of fallout shelters. And we'll also look at what is known as the Home Preparedness Award Program. Things that you will get for having your own fallout shelter, pamphlets and what have you. And of course, to get the award, they have a list of goals for you. So we'll look through those goals and see what they are. But I think you'll enjoy the Family Shelter Designs book in particular. I'll also be showing you a manual that was given out to anyone in the state of New York if they were preparing a fallout shelter. It's quite excellent. Matter of fact, it's so good, the U.S. government asked them to recall it because it was a little too blunt just exactly as to what would happen. But again, like last time, I'm down here in the dungeon. We're going to go upstairs into my library where we're a little more civilized. Not quite as, you know, constrained down here as you would have been. Can you imagine staying 14 days in the dark down here with uh, maybe some candles and what have you, hoping that when the bomb went off, it didn't take the top of your house off with it. But everybody had to be positive. So let's go upstairs. Well, we're out of the dungeon. We're back up in my library. So what we're going to do is talk about this. The Family Radiation Kit. Now, I'm going to go through this at the end. I need to give you some information prior to us going in here because to have something like this would require some significant knowledge on your part as to what you needed. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people were more interested in into a local fallout shelter because they expected the government to have all this stuff available. But if you're planning to work it out at the house, there's a couple of things that you can get. Now, there's all sorts of pamphlets that came out during this time period. For example, 10 tips for survival. This isn't just nuclear. This deals with, you know, natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, loss of electricity for long periods of time. It's very, very, very good. But sometimes they're tailored. For example, this one, in time of emergency, a citizen's guide to protection in the nuclear age. Well, this one is particularly special because this one is tailored for one area of the United States. It's the county that has Blair, Nebraska in it. Blair, Nebraska was the SAC command headquarters. So you were guaranteed the Russians were going to drop one of their little friends on you to get rid of this. Now, of course, this was before, this was before they moved the headquarters into the mountain there at Colorado Springs. And it has a lot of detail. It also has a significant map on where you're supposed to go to all the different places that you could be in. So you can find these tailored to that kind of locality. This has a pretty detailed map on the inside of it. And then if you've listened to any of my 
other shows, you've heard me talk about this. This is the famous pamphlet, actually a very large pamphlet, from the state of New York. And it is all inclusive, trying to make sure you know exactly what is going to happen. So the first thing we're going to do before I get to our kit, we're going to look at some of the information that is in here. And it's pretty harrowing, which is one of the reasons why the government suggested that they kind of take this back because it was kind of frightening. And of course, this was done under the administration of Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller. So the first thing that we want to look at is this map. This map that you see is an area of the United States, sometimes colored in red, but you see New York is darker. So this is to bring home the importance of fallout protection. The red is pretty obvious. This is the expected fallout area of the United States in a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. And as you can see, it's pretty extensive. But we have to add in a couple of things here. You notice how from west to east it goes down and then up. This is the natural movement of weather fronts in this area. You know, you have a front that comes down from the north, it comes in the midwest, and then it will eventually slide up and go out to sea. That's what fallout will do. So if you hit Washington at the right time of the year, that fallout could end up going down, up, over, and away. And of course, this will end up going into Europe as well. So if you're in New York, you're going to get fallout from the rest of the country west of them. So New England is not a good place to be. The East Coast is not a good place to be. As you can see, Montana, Idaho, <laughs> sometimes there's some really interesting people up there. I'm not sure that I want to be there in a, at the end of a nuclear war. But we have another problem. If we launch our missiles and hit the Soviet Union and China, guess what? All their fallout will then come down and fall on top of us as well. So we would get theirs and ours as well. So it is frightening. Now, when I was a little kid in the, in the Cold War in the 60s, when the Soviets tested the Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear explosion ever triggered, that set up such a gigantic radioactive cloud that they tracked it on the weather forecasts. And in the United States, as it went over parts of the United States, they told the farmers to bring their cattle in and cover them. And then the milk that they produced, the dairy cows and other animals like that, was then thrown away for a 14, 15 day period of time. And people, that, what, that's, that's kind of strange. Well, the problem is the cow is the most efficient animal in sloughing radiation. It eats grass, it eats stuff that is contaminated, it'll excrete it in its urine, in its feces, in its milk. And this is something I will talk about in one of my other history courses and explain it because I have a book that I bought on eBay that was declassified. I don't know how it ended up on eBay, but it talked about the estimates that there would be a significant outbreak of leukemia in the United States as a result of nuclear testing. Not our own. Our own it was very, very limited because we did most of that out at Annie Talk and Bikini Atoll. It was the Soviet and then the Chinese that came in. And so that was dropped all over the United States. You had 80 test sites scattered around the United States to study this, all at elementary schools. And they determined that in the middle 60s through 1990, you'd have outbreaks of leukemia. And it's due to drinking the milk, the, the radioactivity then gets into your bones, kabing, kaboom, causes problems. But that's another time. So that's one of the maps. Then we go to the one that's a little more specific. If you're living in the state of New York, here is the specific map 
for the state of New York if a 30 megaton warhead goes off in western New York and it shows the fallout cloud as it moves east so you get all the way to the end and of course it does disperse so this gives you an idea of what would take place but of course certainly New York City is going to be hit probably multiple times Albany any other major city in here is going to be hit so this will be quite a mess so when it comes to this book it's very specific on the threat to New York now it has a, another chart in there this is quite good as well it shows the amount of radiation that you could expect from a nuclear blast now remember I've already talked about it could be an air burst it could be they're making an assumption it's going to be a ground burst so in the initial period of the explosion you'll see that the radiation is 3,000 retkins per hour if you get 700 or more you're dead instantly very very quickly then you see seven hour later later it's down to 300 per hour well two hours worth they thought you could survive in reality an hour of that and you're going to be done for and then after 48 hours it's down to 30 and then you see after two weeks it's only three retkins per hour but this is cumulative your body can only take a certain amount of radiation so even at the three retkins per hour being out in it for a hundred hours gives you 300 so that is a, a little troublesome and then here we have another one of the little charts showing what you can expect to happen to you if you get dosed at a certain level so 100 retkins okay you, you're still getting around 200 you start feeling sick according to them you're 300 you are now have in, intestinal problems and you are bedridden you're not going to recover probably from this but they don't say that <laughs> <laughs> and then it says you can see from the 700 what takes place and there's actually a chart in here which shows you uh, how much protection you get from different types of buildings which is why they're putting you underground in a brick building in a concrete building concrete reinforced steel if possible uh, glass isn't going to help you wooden sidings in your house is not going to help you uh, again I keep telling you to do this go to YouTube and look for Cold War uh, preparedness videos where they're they're doing all kinds of stuff and one of them they're down in the basement and then the all clear is signed and signaled and the guy comes up and and there some of his curtains are on fire <laughs> after he's been hit with a nuclear blast there wouldn't be anything there but that that's that's pretty much the way it goes so there's all kinds of things that they tell you that you can do in here but let's look at what they suggest for food because in this case they're telling you if you're going to have your own shelter this is what you should have look at the first two pages here food for fallout shelters this is stuff that should be regularly simply available okay and I'm not going to read through all this you could kind of get the idea here but you need to make to have enough food to provide 2,000 calories for 14 days that's for an adult now remember our fallout shelter you get 750 calories with crackers okay so now in order to get this there's milk non-fat dry evaporated okay juices they want those juices in um, uh, glass containers fruits vegetables peas soups one dish meals 208 ounces jelly jam marmalade glass jars crackers cans or glass jars beverages coffee tea chocolate you want to have sugar you want to have hand candies you want to have salt and then you see on the other side they do again this the same thing calculations for one person's daily ration skim milk half a cup evaporated milk one ounce two tablespoon half a cup of, of um, half a cup of juice peaches one cup spinach half a cup peas half a cup uh, beef soup one cup baked beans with pork one cup beef stewed with vegetables one cup jam 
soda crackers, other crackers, instant cocoa, sugar, and hard candies. And so that comes out to, from a amount of calories, 2,089 calories. Now that's per day. So you're going to spread this out. I guess you could eat it all at one time, but you'll have to spread that out. So And, and it's, as you said, it's readily available. You can pick this stuff up. This is the kind of material I would suggest that most people should have in their houses for natural emergencies. Hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, ice storms, all sorts of things. Flooding. you got to be able to take care of yourself in some cases. And then this final chart shows food for children up to 18 months of age that would last for 14 days. And this is the first time and one of the few times that you actually find this kind of information. So you need 224 ounces of canned milk, evaporated milk. You need 448 ounces of sterile whole milk. You need baby cereals, 28 ounces. And so their daily ration, 16 ounces of milk, two ounces of baby cereal, Calories of 914 per day. Now, that's probably not going to do much for their growth, but it's certainly better than the crackers and water that you would have gotten in the fallout shelter. And of course, if, you, if you're in your own home, you may have other baby food that's available. You just have to make sure that this is in an area where it's going to be safe because you can't have it upstairs in a two-story building that's made out of wood and siding. It needs to be in your basement or in your fallout shelter below ground because otherwise that's, it's going to be gone. So that's a, a very, very nice guide for people as far as the fallout shelters are concerned. And it's a good guide for people who are concerned about modern problems. Okay, then the next thing, what kind of a shelter are you going to have? Well, I've talked about this over and over and over again. I'm going to show you pictures from it. This is the government guide to making your own fallout shelter. And I just picked a few of these because this could go on forever if, if it were to take place. So let's look at a, a few of these. Here we have what is known as the basement sand-filled lumber lean-to. This is one of the cheapest things you can do. Now, the problem with this is it's pretty obvious you're not going to be able to put your food and water and stuff in there. The idea is this will give your bodies extra protection in case of radiation. But you can come out periodically as long as your food is in another in a sheltered area. And I've even seen suggestions where if you do this, that you make another one that's strictly for your food and water and another one for your sanitation. But this is pretty simple to do. It's not going to be very good for bigger than a family of three. And even the family of three is going to be hard pressed. When you consider that you're supposed to stay in this and around this for at least 14 days. And of course, they also suggest, you know, you need a radio, you need to have your own batteries, Actually, shortwave radio is probably better because most of the stations are going to be gone. Maybe you can get some from somewhere else. So that one is the, the lean-to. Then we go to, and you can see this one's bigger, but it, as you can see, it does have a problem. The basement corrugated asbestos cement lean-to shelter. Well, that's bigger. You can do all kinds of stuff here. And of course, you see they're covering it with sandbags. Excellent. It's not a problem. So it needs to be stronger which is why you have to have asbestos and you, well, at the cement. But if you have the asbestos, that's supposed to keep the fire hazard down. And I would mention that this comes with plans on how to do this. It also comes with a cost estimate as well. This next one is the concrete block shelter. Very nice. You know, concrete block, you see the ventilation. Uh, you can pile those up significantly. You can, you can make them higher longer. Uh, one of the uh, churches that I attended in the 70s, the parsonage was built in the late 50s. And when they had a party there, 
I was down in the basement with everybody else, which was the, the game room. And I saw a door and I thought, is this a closet? So I opened it. No, it was not. It was a built-in fallout shelter when the house was built. What was above it was the concrete of the garage. So the ceiling was the garage floor. What a wonderful spot to do a build like that. And you could have filled it up with all sorts of different things. Now with freeze-dried food, you could put a couple of years worth of food in there. Your only issue would be water and some other objects. So this is the concrete block. Obviously, if they're getting better. Well, we're going we're gonna to go backwards for a second. I've talked about this before, and I'm sure you're going, what do you mean? What do you mean, Professor Bob? With a corrugated steel culvert. Well, here it is. They're not talking about you running out into the street and crawling into the culvert, which is at least you're underground with for the initial explosion, but heaven help you if it rains while you're in there. In this case, you dig a hole in your backyard and you use the steel culvert as your entry exit port. And then you have your air ventilation. And they make these, I, I don't have one, one of the few things I don't have, uh, they make this hand crank ventilation system, which removes and brings in. And of course, the uh, issue with that is you could be bringing in polluted air at the same time. But again, you're supposed to be in this for 14 days. I would assume people, is, I, would, I would imagine there are a lot of people actually think is that you just get in there until they, they blow the all clear and then you come back out and then they'd all, get, they'd all die of radiation poisoning. So, And then the piece de resistance, the below ground, new construction, clay masonry shelter. And this is not as good as the one that was in the pastor's parsonage, but it is excellent. You're underground, you've got the brick, you've got concrete, you've got ventilation, you can go in and out of the house. I want you to notice the entrance getting in and out of the basement, how it's staggered. So if you do have some kind of radiation or something coming leaking in from that area, you could block that whole area off. And that is the most expensive. They expect they believe that would cost you about twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars. And this is done in the nineteen late fifties, early sixties. So those are some of the plans that you would have for your shelter. But I would assume that most people would probably go downstairs in their basement and hope. You're in our home here. That's what we would do in a tornado. However, there is a, a huge crawl space underneath our new addition to the house that could be utilized. But right now we're just planning on surviving and hoping nothing blows up. So let's get to the big deal. You have now decided you're going to have your own fallout shelter. Where are you going to get your equipment? Well, Bendix Corporation has this. The Family Radiation Measurement kit. Ta da! Now, it has several things here. And I believe when I did the general discussion of this, I talked about how it was $50. It's marked $24.95 on the side, which is pretty good. And you notice that it had two, that's a little dosimeter thing, the, the, the charger and and what have you but it had two of these pens now one of them is used as a determination whether there's radiation or not so you would wear this and if you found radiation then you would check and see that you, it would you know you would put it down and, and look through this and it would tell you that there was radiation in your area and then what you would do is you would take the other one, which is a dosimeter, and you would do the same thing. You would put it back over the little device, turn it on, and you can read how much radiation dosage that you had. So one tells you that there is radiation, and the other one tells you how much you've been dosed. So that would help. Um, this is if you can't get a Geiger counter, and they were pretty expensive. You, know, you couldn't, those little yellow ones and things that I sold you, they may not have been expensive for the government, but certainly. Well, you just couldn't go out and buy one of those. The regular Geiger counters were a little more expensive than you would have found there. 
Okay, now inside of this, it tells you how to use it. And here's the pamphlet. It's a very nice little pamphlet. I'll put the big version of it up here in just a second. And it talks about the rate meter. And the rate meter, which is the tan one, as you can see, it tells you how fast the radiation is bombarding your body at any given moment. Just as a speedometer tells you how fast your car is going. Then the dosimeter, the blue cylinder, records the radiation you have been exposed to from, you, from the time you started using it. Just as a mileage indicator tells you how far your car has gone. Okay? Instructions are very simple. And the charger must be used to set the, the hairline of both the rate meter and the dosimeter to zero. So if you're looking to change, check on radiation, you need to take the rate meter and periodically turn it back to zero so you can see if the radiation is continuing. Evidently, you probably don't want to do that with the, the other one, with the dosimeter, because it would be giving you a false sense of security. Now then, let's flip the page over and see what's on the other side. This has the typical effects of short-term radiation exposure to human beings. And they have it smallest detectable is 15 from a statistical study of people in the blood group. Smallest detectable by lab methods. Smallest dose causing vomiting on the day of exposure in 10% of the people, that's 75 retkins. Now we use millicuries now. It's a little harder to figure out what's going on at this point. The science is kind of taking the scare out. It's still bad. And then you see at 100, the smallest dose causing loss of hair and two weeks in at least 10% of the people. So that's at 100. Now let's go all the way over here to the end. Death in minutes due to the central nervous system damage. 2,000 to 10,000 retkins. 600. Severe illness due to gastrointestinal tract damage. Survivors unlikely. Median lethal dose fatal to 50% of people in 2 to 12 weeks. And that is 450. So that, that's, a little, that's a little brutal. When you get information like that, you really, you want to dig deeper <laughs> if you're going to put your fallout shelter into place. Now, of course, you'll have people who go, oh, you know, this is, it's a waste of time. You know, well, uh, when time comes, I don't know how many people would actually walk out and just watch the bombs go off. We all have that sense of survival. But anyway, that's your little dosimeter and measuring kit for your house. And then I mentioned that there were a couple of things that, that you could do. Uh, that was, uh, you, you could get into a government program. How to Earn Your Home Preparedness Award. Now, this might seem kind of odd. I mean, you're going to Home Preparedness Award. Well, yeah, you know, you, you get a sense of accomplishment. You get a little thing. Maybe you're in competition with your neighbors. But you do get all kinds of stuff. How to keep your local government going, a little pamphlet. Handbook for emergencies. Now the last few pages of this are for nuclear emergencies. The rest of them are what we have all the time. Electricity's out, flooding, tornadoes, all sorts of natural disasters. That's that kind of thing. It's actually still good. You know, have a medical kit, have a flashlight. Have some food and water. In this case, it says for a few days. But as you go through the disasters, obviously it says two weeks uh, in the other at that point. And then they have a little how to, you know, it's a little citation booklet, which tells you somewhere you can read. And you'll get a, a little pamphlet that you can, well, you actually, you get a certificate that you can put up on the wall. I, I got this years later, so I don't have a certificate to show you. And I haven't found one. And then inside of it, what you have to do is you have to keep track, mark these things, sign it, and address it. And it's, it's a piece of paper. Uh, they have 
this this piece of paper, which you, I'm going to put it up briefly on the screen, but you can't really see it very well because it's, it's in mimeograph blue, which is kind of faded. But the one side of it is sources that you can readily get at the library and what have you and read to get more information. The other one is what you need to do to get the award. So let me briefly read down the checklist. Know the warning signals and what they mean. Well, the fallout shelter siren is exactly the same as the siren that when they, when they do tornado drills. Okay. Uh, know your community plan for emergency action. Select your family shelter area. Have plans for emergency cooking. How are you going to cook your food? I'll use the microwave. Need some electricity. And I'm not really sure if you had an electric car today, you could count on that because of the electromagnetic pulse. We have no idea what that would do. It usually destroys electronic and all sorts of wiring and stuff, which is why the Air Force One is wired with gallium so it won't crash in a nuclear attack. Uh, have a plan for emergency heating. That's a little easier, although heating and cooking could go together. Although it's really hard to start a fire in the culvert. Uh, plans for emergency lighting. What to do about radioactive fallout. Have a two-week supply of food and water. Are you prepared to purify unsafe water? And that's relatively easy. A you know, gallon of, I think it's two teaspoons of uh, bleach in a gallon of water. I think takes care of that. I may have just poisoned you. You better check that. Um, prepare, um, have a radio, which does not depend on a commercial source of power. Know the Conrad station. These are special stations set up by the government to give emergency information. And then prepare to listen to the survival information. Have a first aid kit, emergency clothing and, belt, um, and blankets, Clo uh, recreational and morale supplies. So games and other things to do. That's not, that's, they don't tell you that in the government one. <laughs> I'm sure somebody will bring a deck of cards so they can try and fleece you. Uh, do fire preventive housekeeping. Have emergency firefighting plans and equipment. Have emergency sanitation plans and preparations. Have plans for evacuation in accordance with community plan. Have a family emergency plan, which everyone is familiar. And then maintain a current uh, preparation with state and local. It's very simple. It doesn't require very much. As a matter of fact, they don't even seemingly require proof. You just sign it, put your address on it, and it says keep one of these forms for reference. When you merit the award, sign one and return it to your civil defense chairman. So you may have a local chairman who will then come and double check this. So they're not just printing these out like crazy. But again, it's, it's good advice. The uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Administration, you go to their website, they have all kinds of information. It's very similar to this. I'll warn you, if you look at the one that talks about nuclear attack, it's not any different than the one that I showed you from the New York. It shows us being just completely blanketed uh, with, uh, with radiation. So that's what it's like to be at home. At least you're at home. You have your own familiar surroundings. You're not with a bunch of other people going crazy. Now, of course, then we have the other problem. What if your neighbors know that you have your own fallout shelter? And there have been any number of, of movies and television shows that were done in the 50s and early 60s. Several of them on the, on the Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Where they've got, they've, one of my favorites is uh, friends are over, you know, and they're having dinner and goofing around and suddenly the sirens go off. And they turn the radio on that says, we are under attack. It's about 10 minutes until the, the bombs will land. And everybody, for the most part, who was aware of this knew how long they had. About 15, 20 minutes from an ICBM launched in Russia to get to the United States. Now, if they launch them by submarine, you don't have hardly any time. But again, I was in southern Missouri. Nobody was going to destroy our barbecue business. So anyway, in the, in the film, the, now the people are, that are guests are told to leave. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they get they guess that there's a fallout shelter in the house, and so they uh, they they basically throw them out, lock the door, and then these people just start pounding and pounding and pounding. And of course, the dilemma is: do we do we bring our friends in and it reduces the amount of survival food that we have, and all sorts of dilemmas. But in this particular case, what happens is it turned out to be a drill. And so at the end, the uh, they weren't friends anymore. So there's all kinds of, of that stuff out there and about. So now next time I've got I've got one more of these and I'll do the Swiss fallout shelter material, which is incredibly uh, descriptive and effective. And it really, if you could steal one, get one, if you could find something like that, that would be really great. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Hope I didn't scare you too much again. Pretty soon I'm not going to scare you anymore. We're just going to look at just regular stuff like helmets and medieval armor and, and other things like that. But if you if you liked what, what we did here today, please click the like button. And if you want to subscribe, please subscribe. I do a variety of shows, obviously. The, uh, the uh, Today's Artifact, the um, Traveling Professors, and my regular history material, Teaching History. So thank you very much.